My dear sisters and brothers in Jesus Christ, last evening on the Children's Bible, a chat on WhatsApp, somebody sent a, a clip of the, of the Pentecost, which is from the movie AD and Kingdoms, AD Kingdoms on Netflix. And it's so beautiful because prior to that, you see Peter so disturbed and all the apostles are disturbed and they're hiding in this small little place, moving from one room to another room. It reminds us of the lockdown and people staying in the same house and moving from one side to the other side to let somebody else move around. And then in that confusion, Peter's wife, daughter says, Dad, what's wrong? She wants to leave and go back. And she says, I'm disturbed. And then she turns around and tells him, you know, what would Jesus do if he was here? And Peter says, he would tell us to pray. So why don't you pray? And she says, but what to pray? And she says, what did he teach you? He says, he taught us to say, Abba, Father. So say it. And then you see this beautiful scene. They're saying, our Father, so loudly and repeating our Father, whole our Father, again and again and again. And then the Spirit falls. My dear sisters and brothers in Jesus Christ, it's not what prayers we say. It is the heart that really matters. And so often, we ask ourselves, who is this Holy Spirit? There are various images of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, like the finger of God at creation and the Ten Commandments, or fire by day and cloud, fire by night and cloud by day in the book of Exodus and so on. And these old symbols represent the one true God. And so what or who is this Holy Spirit? You know, very often when you go to churches, you find uh, on the lectern a dove or an eagle to represent St. John. And non-Christians wonder, you say you worship one true God, then what are these animal images? A lamb here, right at the foot of the altar. What are these animals? And we have to explain to them that God was using images that people would understand, otherwise they would not be able to comprehend. My dear sisters and brothers, the church defines the Holy Spirit as the third person in the Trinity. And I found that a bit difficult to explain to our students when we talk about the third person of the Trinity. And the other day when I was reflecting on the Gospel in John 15, verse 5, my father is the gardener, I am the branch, and you are the wine. And I said, wow, that's the Trinity. The father is the gardener, Jesus is the branch, and we are the wines. And the fruit is the Holy Spirit, which will come into us. And so first and foremost, the father loves the son so much. John 3.16, God so loved the world that he sent his only son and Jesus will go on and say, I do the will of my Father because I love him. And so the love, this is always explained by Thomas Aquinas and St. Augustine, St. Irenaeus this morning. The love of God, the Father, flows to the love of to Jesus. And that love of Jesus flows back to the Father. And that love which flows up and down between the two is not just a force. All right, it is a person, and that person is the Holy Spirit. And that is why the Holy Spirit would come only after Jesus goes back to the Father. And that is why the Catholic Church says the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. This one proverb proceed caused a lot of divisions and heresies in the first few centuries to such an extent that the Greek Orthodox Church broke away from us because of that word proceeds. We believe that the Father's love pours in the Son and the Son's love goes back and that love, that movement, that spirit is the Holy Person, Holy Spirit, a person. And therefore the Church will never talk about the Holy Spirit as it. You will see in various examples and we do the Holy Spirit, He is a person. And we say, do not grieve the Holy Spirit in Ephesians 4.30 and, and so on. We talk about the Spirit as a person. Now, when we were baptized, we received this Holy Spirit. 
we receive the deposits of this Holy Spirit as John's gospel begins in chapter 1 verse 12 to all those who acknowledge Jesus they will be called sons and daughters of God and so I don't subscribe to this idea that everybody can be called sons and daughters of God we all bring to God in different ways and so on it says very clearly in John 1 12 to all those who believe in me the son they have the authority to call God their father John chapter 1 verse 12 You'll find this repeated again in John 14, where Jesus says, I will send the Spirit to teach you what is sin, what is righteousness, and what is justice. And sin is all those who do not believe in Jesus Christ. So I don't think we should learn to water down and try to be politically correct about various things. If I follow Jesus, I follow what Jesus teaches us. And so, my dear sisters and brothers, we are caught up in this love. And this love of the Father and the Son and the Spirit in between flows into us at baptism and manifests itself in a mighty way in confirmation. We don't teach a child how to write an essay or a book in grade one. It has to learn the alphabets, sentence structures and so on. And that is where Sunday school comes in. But at that level of adulthood, the Holy Spirit will come into us in a mighty way. As a person, the Holy Spirit does not dominate. God gave us the choice of freedom, which Adam misused. But God gives us that gift. And therefore, as a person, the Holy Spirit will stand outside until you welcome the Holy Spirit. So often we sing in prayer groups, welcome Holy Spirit. It's only then that the Holy Spirit, as a perfect gentleman, will come into your life. My dear sisters and brothers, it's very easy to differentiate between the good spirit and the evil spirit. The good spirit will prompt you, will tell you this is right and this is wrong and so on. But the bad spirit will command you will force you and so on. Look at your life of addiction. It's the evil spirit that just makes it so compulsory, so commanding, go on to fail. And that is the difference, my dear sisters and brothers. And when this Holy Spirit comes into us, as Jesus says in John 10.10, 10, we receive the fruit of the Holy Spirit. So often I hear people preaching, say, fruits of the Holy Spirit. No. The Holy Spirit gives you a singular fruit. For me, it reminds me of a pomegranate. You know, sometimes when I look at church architecture and do uh, pomegranates adorn the old marble columns and so on, maybe there was a purpose and a reason. But this pomegranate, if you split it, besides the color of fire and flame, it has, I don't know how many seeds. But each of those seeds are going to have the possibility of producing another fruit. And that is what like the Holy Spirit is. He will give you the fruit, the pomegranate in your lives. And the other fruits will manifest accordingly. And so my dear sisters and brothers, this fruit that God gives us is quite different. I was just checking the number of the word times fruit and fruits that appear in the Old Testament. And it appears in many ways, once as a plural, once as a verb, sometimes as a produce and so on. But what struck me very much was the difference between the fruit of Adam and Eve where all our sin begins and the fruit of the Holy Spirit. In the fruit of Adam and Eve in the book of Genesis, it is Eve who grabs greed, grab, insecurity, etc. and just grabs that fruit when the serpent offers it. In the Holy Spirit, the fruit is given to us to those who want it. It's not grabbed. It's given. And if you don't want it, it's okay. In the fruit of the Genesis is disobedience. And I said, the evil spirit, you're compelled, compulsion. Whereas in the fruit of the Holy Spirit, it flows into us out of obedience. And that also, obedience is not compulsory. Nobody forces you to do anything. Thirdly, the fruit of the, holy, of the Garden of Eden comes from idleness 
and scheming. Whereas the fruit of the Holy Spirit comes from fasting, prayer, meditation, and the word of God. The effects of the fruit in the book of Genesis is pleasure. And pleasure is for a moment. And it goes. And guilt sets in. Whereas the fruit of the Holy Spirit is lasting. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, forbearance, gentleness, and self-control. And so when you welcome the Holy Spirit into your life, as 1 Corinthians 6, 9 or 19 says, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And when you allow that Holy Spirit to dwell in you, that Holy Spirit will give you the gift of hope. In a situation like today in COVID-19, and we're looking at the lockdowns and the rules and so on, we don't have total freedom. And every morning I get so many people saying, Father, please pray for us. We are losing our jobs or we have lost our jobs and so on. And it's such a sense of insecurity. But the Holy Spirit today promises us that if you stay close to God, things will work out. There is always that hopelessness can change to hope. You can read Romans 15 verse 13 where it says, The God of hope will fill you with his peace and joy. And then the Holy Spirit also gives us the gift of good health. Romans 8, 11. You know, my distant brothers, as I just now quoted 1 Corinthians 6, 19, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And doctors have often said, and even yesterday I was watching a program on how stress can reduce your immunity systems. And that stress is when you don't have peace. And when you don't have the Holy Spirit within you, you in decrease your immunity systems. That is why people are saying and during this COVID-19, relax, sleep a lot, make sure your immunity systems are developed. But these can break down in no time. I'm so amazed or surprised that so many people I know who didn't have any signs of COVID or anything have died in this last two weeks. Senior people, priests, and most of all, it's because of heart attacks. And begin to ask yourself, how come? And anyone who no signs of illness already got one this morning from East Africa and I begin to ask myself I mean, he did, just spoke to him yesterday and so things like this and that's where we have the psychosomatic diseases and therefore Romans 8 says 11 says if you believe in the Holy Spirit he will make sure that your mortal bodies will remain healthy in the spirit my dear sisters and brothers the other day I was watching this world conference of preparing for the Pentecost. And there was this man called Simon Carrington from Australia. And Simon Carrington, when he began his 25 minutes talk, first five minutes, he stammered so much. I said, is there something wrong with my sound system or the internet connection or something? And then he said, I stammer. And yet... Simon Carrington surrendered this stammering to God, to the Holy Spirit, and today Simon, Simon, Sam, Simon Carrington is a world-renowned speaker of the, talking about the effects of the Holy Spirit. Sure, he says, I was embarrassed, I was made fun of, people were trying to fill in words for me and trying to, try to have sympathy for me. I thought I would never get married. Who's going to take me to their house and say, Dad, I'm marrying this guy. And yet I'm married and I have a good family and so on. This is when you allow the Holy Spirit to come into your life. The Holy Spirit makes you holy, sanctifies you. Ephesians 1, 4, 9, uh, 1, Ephesians 1, 4, that tells uh, you are chosen before all gen uh, creation to be holy and blameless in his sight. And so often I quote 1 Peter 2, 9. You are a chosen generation, a people set apart. Sanctifying means separated, set apart. And that's what you are. And the Holy Spirit makes you that sanctified person. My dear sisters and brothers in Jesus Christ, when we look at all this, we see how the Holy Spirit can transform us. You know, in 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 3, 
speaks all about the wrong things that happen in us, the lust, etc., and so on. And the next chapter, 1 Thessalonians 5, 3 says, but if you let the Holy Spirit flow into you, everybody says, follow the flow, go with the flow. Why don't we let the Holy Spirit come into us as a flow? And once you let this Holy Spirit flow into yourself, you begin to experience all these things that hold you back. St. Paul says, it's not the sin of the flesh, but you get the joy of the Spirit. And the sin of the flesh, my sin brothers, we need to clear this concept. According to St. Paul, which I'll be talking on Tuesday, flesh is not just sex and lust. Flesh is living according to worldly standards. And you and I know that when we follow the flesh, we are all the time trying to keep up with the Jones, trying to keep up with our neighbor. And besides that, there are so many things with the flesh that hold us down. Addictions. Pornography is the largest addiction in the world today. Married men also are involved in pornography. Pornography, And then you have masturbation. And then you have womanizing, addiction to gadgets, your cell phone, and so on. My dear sisters and brothers, this is when we need the Holy Spirit. He controls you. He helps you to control your desires. As St. Paul says in Romans 7, one of my other favorite passages, the good I want to do, I don't do. But the bad I don't want to do, I do. Who will help me? Thanks be to Jesus Christ the giver of the Holy Spirit. And lastly, my dear and brothers, the Holy Spirit helps us to forgive. And if we ask the Holy Spirit, he will help us to pray for those who hurt us. You know, the person that you pray for will be on your praying list. But if you don't pray for that person, he is on your hit list. But the same person cannot be on your hit list and your praying list because the Holy Spirit will not permit it. And that's why we need that Jesus said, pray for those who persecute you. Pray for those who don't love you. Pray for those who are criticizing you. Pray for them because the Holy Spirit will make a transformation, not in them, but in you. In you. You know, we're always praying for a change outside there. No. It begins with us. Mahatma Gandhi said, you have to be the beginning of the change. Something from what Saint Mahatma Gandhi picked up from Jesus. And therefore, when we pray to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit transforms me. And I begin to see things in a different light. I begin to say things do not matter. These things are okay. It's fine. It's part of life. And you, all that you can do is to pray for that person. My dear sisters and brothers in Jesus Christ, I just want to end with what Pope Francis said when he's talked to married people in this light of forgiveness. He said, three words that must be part of your vocabulary in your family. Not I love you, but three words. And the three words is please. We have so many kids in our school who don't even know to say please. I want water. I want crayons. Say please. And this word, please, comes from parents who teach their child to say that. Please, show respect, concern about the other person. And there'll be less misunderstandings. The second word he says is thank you. Be grateful to all people. St. Paul says again in Thessalonians 5, I say rejoice and be grateful to God at all times. Be grateful. And thirdly, he says, the most difficult word is say, Sorry. I'm sorry. I am that mistake. Don't justify because justification never helps. Justification helps to cause a hurt to be submerged and fester again some other time. My dear sisters and brothers in Jesus Christ, I would like to end with what Jeremiah says In all your difficulties, I have loved you with an everlasting love. 